Welcome to the Public Sector Marketing Show, a podcast for government and public sector marketing professionals who want to level up their digital marketing and social media knowledge, skills, and strategic thinking. And now, welcome your host, Joanne Sweeney. Hello, and welcome to episode 61 of the Public Sector Marketing Show. Diplomacy has been around for centuries and is most associated with politicians and policymakers. Some people have a talent for diplomacy, and then there are companies that sell it as a service. But diplomacy has taken on a new form in the digital age, with the ability of diplomats to amplify and scale messaging at the touch of a button. Coming up in today's show, what is digital diplomacy in practice? Seven steps to social media success in digital diplomacy, And I speak to Miha and Ingrid from the European Digital Diplomacy Exchange. We discuss the power of digital diplomacy to protect democracy, build public trust, and empower politicians and policymakers. Digital diplomacy is the use of the internet to engage with those in authority, in governments, and in public sector for gain in terms of gaining meetings, gaining access, lobbying for particular positions on a wide variety of issues, and also getting to the decision maker. As you will appreciate, pre the internet diplomacy very much happened in boardrooms and in corridors of powers. And I would argue that diplomacy was really in the hands of the powerful. But things have changed, as we know, and the voice of the citizen is becoming increasingly noisy, but also increasingly heard within those corridors. And I think the corridors of power have moved from government buildings to social media channels. Now, you might argue that that sounds a little bit uh, crass or minimalizing what diplomacy actually is. But I truly believe that right now in the digital age, politicians are indeed delivering digital diplomacy through their social networks. We actually see diplomats from different countries communicating with each other. And then you have policymakers and communications advisors and strategists behind the scenes, analyzing, watching, monitoring and listening to public sentiment around potentially future political and legislative decisions. Diplomacy is also something that we must think about in terms of democracies and where we're sitting. Um, One of the most obvious examples of digital diplomacy happening right now before our eyes on our smartphones and through social media is President Zelensky in Ukraine And indeed, he has swapped his suit for coats of arms on the front line as he leads out his army to defend the country of Ukraine. His powerful addresses to governments across the world have happened, I would argue, because of his use of digital diplomacy, his visibility on social networks, the public rowing in behind from nations across the world and demonstrating and showing that support and that resulting in historic addresses into parliaments. Indeed, most recently, President Zelensky uh, beamed into the Irish government's uh, main house of the Oireachtas in the Dáil uh, and he addressed us for 10 minutes. This was live streamed also on social media by the government, but also by mainstream media outlets. And radio stations stopped normal programming schedules in order to broadcast live President Zelensky's address. Such was the power of his message, but also the anticipation from the viewing public. So let's not forget, while diplomacy happens still within the corridors of power, though the listening public are also powerful because their sentiment and their response can be gauged and monitored in the moment. So I would say digital diplomacy as a skill set and as a discipline is really important in the modern world of political diplomacy. 
Level up your social media skills by taking our diploma in social media, plus gain an industry qualification. Use the code SOCIALMEDIA20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com. So when it comes to successful digital diplomacy, what does it look like? Well, I have written a chapter for a new book published by the European Digital Diplomacy Exchange, who are also guests on this week's podcast, and they've created a practitioner's guide, Be a Digital Diplomat, and that is coming out really, really soon. So in today's consulting segment, I wanted to give you a sneak preview of my chapter in that book. And so what I'm saying to digital diplomats is that the real battle online is for attention. There's no doubt that you can reach people, reach stakeholders and organizations, but you actually want to get their listening ear and thus you want their attention and their engagement and then perhaps even their motivation to take an action. So in this chapter for the book, I've put together seven steps to social media success in digital diplomacy. So I'm really leaning in on social for this one. And first of all, we're talking about building public trust because diplomacy can happen within corridors of power, as I said uh, in the previous segment, but you really want to engage the public and get their trust. So using social media in the first instance to build trust for your political party, if you're a politician for yourself, for the paper that you're working on uh, ahead of bringing it to a uh, legislative stages, then you'll want to start teasing that out, having early conversations, priming your audience and building that trust and authority. And social media is a great way to do it, of course. And then secondly, we're looking at engaging the public. So actually getting them to interact with you in some way. So potentially you're running polls, you're maybe running virtual focus groups, you're inviting them along to public consultation fora, whatever it is. At this stage of the social media strategy, you're really looking for meaningful engagement. And this is where the public uh, have, have got your attention but then they want to have their say and you are actively listening. So number three then is moving the public to another stage by using social media and that is motivating them to take a specific action based on factual and trusted information. So if we're using social media, there is a sort of a presumption here that you've been building out your social media campaign around this issue for a number of weeks, if not a number of months, priming them, informing them, giving them factual information. They've been information gathering, they've been listening, and now at this stage, they're ready to take an action. It might be to vote, it might be to have their say in a citizens' assembly, for example, almost as a precursor to a legislative change but you're really building in a call to action at this stage of your social media strategy. Then on an ongoing basis, again around the same topic, so we're taking a single topic for this process, is that you're communicating in real time. So real time public interest messages around this topic. Why is that important? Well, it's important because you've got their attention, you've got the public's engagement, you've built up this audience who have even been motivated to take an action and now they're looking to you as the trusted source of information and to be the broadcaster and the informer of any news relating to this topic. So being relevant in real time and being that authoritative voice is really important. Number five then is what I call managing your online reputation. Inevitably you're going to have an opposing view many opposing views coming from many parts of the social media world. Uh, even within that, you might have trolls and you might have bots um, and you might have um, a political opposition um, and even people who do not have good intent and are there with malicious intent to maybe disrupt democracy and to spread disinformation. So what you have to do is to stand up against this, manage your own online reputation, speak the truth when you see 
uh, mistruths and defend your truth and your tribe also. Uh, and that leads me to number six, and that disrupting the spread of misinformation. I've long held the view that if subject matter experts, diplomats, politicians, policymakers who are leaders and who are leading the public on key debates, who stand idly by and watch disinformation spread, I truly believe you are a contributor to that problem. There's an onus on you to step in to disrupt the spread of misinformation and be the guardian of the truth. And then finally, is to build and to nurture that tribe of advocates who have stuck with you and who really believe that you have information that they feel is valuable and that is informing them to make their own mind up because that is exactly what a democracy is. Uh, free speech, it's the sharing of ideas, different views on, on single topics and then allowing the public to, to make a decision and, and to vote with their feet as they say. So if you're engaged in digital diplomacy, why not try this framework and also get hands on the Digital Diplomat book when it comes out soon from the European Digital Diplomacy Exchange. A one-stop shop digital marketing and social media resource. Join our membership academy for 12 months. Access a library of how-to videos, template strategies, and organizational policies. Monthly live coaching. Attend webinars with subject matter experts. Meet and network with public sector pros from across the world. Use the code MEMBERSHIP20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com. In today's episode, I want to introduce you to our brand new knowledge product, and it's called Social Media Done For You. Think of it as like social media in a box. All the tools, strategies, and policies that you would need to implement great social media within your government or public sector agency. We've just released it on our website, publicsectormarketingpros.com, and you have lifetime access. And this includes any updates that I make to the resources. So what can you expect? Well, you have a template social media strategy, you have a range of social media policies, you have a 365 day inspiration calendar for social media, you also have checklists when it comes to hashtags, social and live video, auditing of your social platforms, and you also have template graphic designs that we have created in Canva and all of these come with tutorial videos. So if you want our social media done for you product, go ahead, check it out on our website. And really the price is amazing. So let's go deeper into digital diplomacy in practice. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by Miha Ilk and Ingrid Omahna from the European Digital Diplomacy Exchange. Ingrid is head of strategic communication program at the Center for European Perspective. She's managing the European Digital Diplomacy Exchange project with the US Department of State since it began back in 2017, and she works on other projects. Miha, meanwhile, is project manager of the European Digital Diplomacy Project at Centre for European Perspective. And along with that work, he is currently pursuing a master's degree on the topic of digital diplomacy. Really thrilled to have a the opportunity to have this conversation with Miha and Ingrid. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining me on the Public Sector Marketing Show. And I'm going to go straight in with my first question. First of all, tell our viewers and our listeners about the European Digital Diplomacy Exchange. Why were you formed and what work do you carry out across Europe? Thanks, Joanne, for hosting us. Um, to tell you a little bit of uh, the background. Basically, uh, governments have been uniquely challenged by the proliferation of digital uh, communication channels. On one hand, they never had that much access to domestic and foreign pu uh, publics, access that they can use to understand and inform their audiences. On the other, proliferation and democratization of digital media space has increased their narrative competition and opened them up to a number of consequential challenges, including proactively destructive 
counter narratives and disinformation. So since 2017, um, Center for European Perspective and the US Department of State have been conducting a project on digital diplomacy titled European Digital Diplomacy Exchange, as you already mentioned. Uh, this is an intergovernmental network of government communicators um, that, have been, that has been committed to increasing members' collective capacities to effectively operate um, in the digital information space. A fundamental offering of this network is hands-on government-to-government digital strategic uh, communications guidance, training, and mentorship. Uh, we usually conduct trainings and workshops uh, that offer tools to our government communicators to become more proactive and collaborative in the battle against disinformation, focusing on the Eastern uh, European and Western Balkan countries. Uh, the project actually expanded his, uh, its geographical scope in 2018, um, basically to Baltic states, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania. And I can totally see the gap and the need that you guys are filling. And I hope at some stage, the work that you're doing is extended right across Europe, because I don't think that we will ever be done in filling those digital gaps and that digital capacity. But let's talk a little bit more about digital diplomacy. And, you know, diplomacy has been around forever. Now it just happens in the online world. But some people, I think, are a bit suspect or don't give digital diplomacy the credit that it deserves. Do you think that digital diplomacy has any meaningful influence or impact? Uh, thank you, Jan, also from my side for invitation and for this interview. Uh, straight to the question, yes, we believe that. Just to go step back, let's say if we define uh, digital diplomacy as the usage of the information and communication technologies to pursue foreign policy goals, it definitely has a meaningful uh, influence and impact, uh, particularly on the practice of diplomacy. We can see uh, how digital diplomacy has changed the way how government, uh, governments and governmental institutions uh, are using information and communication technologies to communicate with the public. We can notice, for example, uh, new communication strategies developing. We can see the governments expanding their communication departments, uh, using new tools, practices, just to have an impact on the public. We can also see ambassadors tweeting, having live streams, social media profiles, even on TikTok and so on and so on. So in this sense, we can really see that the institution, government and state institutions are realizing that digital diplomacy is, is extremely important and beneficial for pursuing their goals and the impact is also visible for everyone who is on social media. And of course, pre the internet, the main tools of diplomacy were engaging journalists, writing press releases, getting that all important media coverage. Now, I know that journalists get a little bit upset with me when I talk about social media being mainstream media. And as a former journalist, I understand the skills uh, required in order to um, uphold the truth. And so do you think that traditional diplomacy is still important and maybe the happy medium is combining it with digital diplomacy? Well, we all know that, of course, global mass communications and advance, advances in new information and communication technologies are presenting a new challenge to traditional way of, of course, conducting uh, international relations in particular. Um, that increased availability, accessibility and speed of uh, transmission of large quantities of information to the global audience in real time is causing more and more complex management of state affairs, which is very, very difficult like for traditional um, diplomacy basically to manage. So that's why the environment of diplomacy is importantly changing. Um, as digital um, diplomacy information technologies 
influence the interconnection of international actors. Uh, they also enable the possibility of bypassing traditional authorities in accessing um, the information and con consequently impact the speed of decision-making process. So the mode of conducting diplomacy um, is changing, therefore it's forced to communicate with many new actors and the international stage to new means of communication, not just traditional. Um, and of course, confronted with this time pressure, um, of course, it still needs to remain credible, responsive, and of course, transparent. Unlike traditional diplomacy, digital diplomacy allows anyone, everyone, anywhere, anytime to have a voice. So individuals are no longer just passive receivers of um, information, but they actually correspond directly and uh, horizontally. Um, they comment, influence, and form public opinion. Um, and this one-way communication no longer exists. So uh, their support is crucial in basically successful uh, shaping and implementation of policies. And in order to achieve uh, the credibility of implemented policies, uh, the broadest segments of population must be involved in this decision-making process. So in my opinion, no, traditional diplomacy is not enough anymore. And I know that we both are aligned in terms of the, the value of digital diplomacy and also in educating and sharing our, our knowledge across the internet and thus across the world. But you, you have taken it a step further and you've coordinated a new publication entitled Be a Digital Diplomat, Diplomat a Guide for Digital Diplomacy Practitioners. This is a, such a valuable handbook. Tell our viewers and listeners what contents are within it and when and how can they get their hands on it. Thank you so much and thank you also for contributing to our publication. Uh, as Ingrid said, <clears throat> we are trying to, uh, to educate our network and our members with, through trainings we organize. So the aim with this, uh, this publication was also to provide uh, them with the practical, uh, to, be as, to be as practical as possible. So this guy is basically written for the part partitioners, partitioners of digital diplomacy and for all those who want to explore and deeper the practical aspect of it. Basically the aim is uh, to showcase practicality and provide some sort of like a manual or guidance to get better at uh, doing the digital diplomacy. So in this manner the articles and the publication uh, in the publications are uh, assembled in a way to provide as much practical knowledge as possible, such as how to apply digital marketing to build trust, how to develop better stories, how to be authentic in a digital space, what's the science behind the hashtag, and how to use it, uh, how to work with influencers, how to build digital campaigns, how to communicate in crisis, and uh, last but not least, how to find, uh, find this information. And so is that publication available now for people to download on your website? The publication is not yet av available now because we are uh, still working on some uh, minor details, but it will be uh, available in the foreseeable future. So <laughs> very short. <laughs> well, as somebody, as somebody who is currently finishing her book, I understand why you're not committing to a time frame because it's very difficult at the end process to get all those edits correctly but I have to say guys I've seen the contents and I've contributed one chapter but I highly recommend you get your hands on it so I will link uh, the website in the blog post associated with this podcast and you can go back and check it out and of course when it is available I will also share it on my social networks with you. But, you know, um, the political situation in Europe right now, I guess we can't not discuss it. Um, it's tense. We're, we're watching um, the invasion happening um, through our smartphones, through our social networks, day in, day out. And, you know, the Ukrainian Prime Minister Vladimir Zelensky has swapped his suit now for a coat of arms and he is on the front line. And 
he is making a big impact. So I watched his address here in Ireland about a couple of weeks ago and he addressed our national parliament. And honestly, every single TV station and radio station for that 30 minutes paused every other broadcast as we listened to his address. And he's doing that in parliaments right across Europe and indeed beyond Europe as well. So it just leads me to to ask the question, you know, does social media play a serious role in diplomatic relations? And is social media helping the case of the Ukrainians in communicating what's happening on the ground there? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm not just going to say that um, Zelensky is doing uh, a great job. I think that the whole his team is doing like a remarkable, remarkable job. Um, as you can see, I mean, they're like really like, you know, we, uh, Mika's going to explain that later, but what we started doing uh, was also like collaborative messaging on Ukraine crisis um, with um, all the governments that are, not all of the governments, but most of the governments that are involved in our EDI network. And uh, we see like those people, you know, tweeting from shelters uh, while they're bombing them. I mean, uh, like many of them are working abroad. I mean, and it's 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 really strong, and it's 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 a huge basically. Um, it shows how important like digital media actually is nowadays. Of course, it all started like you know a few years ago few years ago let's say five years ago also if you remember like uh donald trump for instance i just checked uh zelensky's uh, twitter account today and just noticed that he only has six million followers um whereas uh, uh trump had uh, before they suspended his twitter account had 88.7 million uh, followers um, on his account However, um, yes, definitely, I think that this is this is the new reality we're facing. Um, so, um, just we we all need to think digital. Yeah, I truly believe that the impact of the storytelling and that real life reporting from citizens is it's citizen journalism at its best and i think that is why the world is touched and then the politicians and the parliaments are responding because you you cannot not respond to it but let's step into the practice and the application of your work and do you have a project that you've recently worked on that you can share with us and perhaps what impact that has made Yes, uh, recently, like we just uh, came back two weeks ago from Georgia, uh, we conducted a training there for communicators of Georgian government. Uh, we did basically a two-day training in Tbilisi, and it was our basically first in-person event after almost a year. Uh, so we had around 30 participants from different ministries and the government institution, and the outcome was really good. We, as as usual, we focused on the practicality and the comments we received back was it that it was too short for two days. Uh, along uh, uh, along this, um, another thing is that uh, we we are what Ingrid also mentioned before. We are also doing like a collaborative messaging on the war in Ukraine. Uh, with this activity, we basically managed to mobilize our network, establish uh, established uh, messaging platform, uh, set up a weekly meetings where the countries are sharing the information about uh, their messaging, and they of course coordinate uh, these messaging efforts about the war in Ukraine. So this is what we are doing since uh, February, January. Uh, just today we had a meeting again. Uh, so this is like uh, takes a large part of our of our work as well. And uh, regarding the future activities, we are now in the process of organizing a four-day general training uh, for government communicators, which will take place in Slovenia in the middle of May. 
And in addition to similar to training for Georgian government, uh, government communicators, we are also in the process of organizing a training for uh, government communicators of Kosovo. Uh, this event will take place in the mid-June. Uh, as I said, like in, the all, in all the activities that we do, we are trying to be as practical as possible. And based on the feedbacks that we got over all these years, most of communicators lack and also desire practice. So we are basically striving uh, to make their work easier and provide them the knowledge about the practical tools that they can use in uh, daily work. For all the great messaging amplification and opportunity that digital and social media brings, then there's the other dark side of the internet and social media. And we still have a huge cohort of policymakers, lobbyists, and those directly involved in digital diplomacy who are really fearful of stepping up online uh, for fear of being cancelled, of being called out, or of being trolled. But how do you balance that when you're convincing your communications professionals and diplomats to, to embrace social? I mean, we're just trying to give them tools um, to learn basically how to how to operate. I mean, the thing is that nowadays, if you are not on, you know, if, if it's not on social media, it didn't happen. So what social media actually offers is like, it's flexible. It, you can engage with your audiences. It's really cost effective. Um, it's also time effective and uh, interactive. Um, one thing that's also super important uh, and worth mentioning is, I'm gonna say targeted marketing. So <laughs> we're talking about governments and politicians. However, like we all know that they, what they sell are policies. So it's also about marketing. So, I mean, today, I'm, I'm actually going to say this, but go digital or go home. I love that, Ingrid, and I think that's, that's the quote off the interview, go digital or go home. And I'm constantly um, preaching this line, but it's so... I guess it's so refreshing to speak to you guys and you know we've communicated over maybe you know under a year now but I, I've watched your work and I'm always trying to surface organizations and groupings that are doing great work to preach this because I believe that in the absence of fact truthful and honest information this just provides the vacuum for fake news and misinformation to rise. So there's not only a role to play, but I think there's a responsibility on our political leaders, our policymakers to be online, whether they like it or not. Um, it has to be embedded into their, into their job descriptions. But let's talk about the public because if we strip everything away, digital diplomacy is for the people. Governments and Policymakers and politicians exist and act in the interests of the citizens that they serve. People are really cynical on social media and they're really cynical of people in power. But do you think that social media provides an opportunity to build trust and transparency? Or in your experience, how is the public uh, receiving digital diplomacy messages? I'm going to say that this is... Uh... This is actually, um, you know, as you already mentioned, Joanne, uh, this is an opportunity like for other actors to enter this space. It's, it's an opportunity for disinformation and misinformation to spread. Although we all know that disinformation is not a new phenomena, but now it can spread really quickly and it can basically reach large, large audiences. So this is one thing that governments um, should take into uh, consideration. Problem is that governments are slowly adjusting. I mean, the thing is, uh, and this is one of the, I'm gonna say like um, long-term objectives of this project, is basically to build this kind of like strategic communication capacities of governments 
um, to equip them with knowledge, with uh, competencies and capacities that are necessary uh, to adequately communicate with their citizens in order to re-establish trust in state institutions and advance policy narratives, uh, critical kind of like to further success of, I'm going to say, okay, uh, of, uh, let's say, um, democratic uh, governmental institutions. So um, this is uh, something that I think governments are still lacking. They're not investing enough in this. So um, that's why our uh, digital diplomacy trainings, I'm going to say. And also, like, when it comes to um, credibility and transparency, we still can see we're, we're working, like, with Eastern European countries and Western Balkan countries. And uh, we see how they operate and we see what they are lacking. And it's sometimes, like, it's, it's really sad to see, I'm going to say that, uh, because they don't have, they don't have, like, social media managers. I mean, they have people... Uh, that are not skilled, that are constantly changing. So um, this is something that we're trying to achieve with this project. This is what we're trying to change. So I truly hope that we're gonna succeed in this like in the long term, because when you're building like strategic uh, capacities of government, you're diminishing the space for disinformation. So this is what we're trying to do. You know, I really appreciate and I see the work that you are doing. I value it. And, you know, we, we work in similar spaces. But the fact of how you were formed and the the kind of terms of reference of why you exist gives it much more credibility. I mean, I'm a private operator operating from the west of Ireland. But you guys have this kind of international standing. And um, I don't think there's ever not going to be a need for your work. So let's just hope it is extended and expanded. And hopefully at some stage you'll come to Ireland and, you know, share all your experiences with us here. Um, I think, you know, Ireland is home to the European headquarters of all the major social networks and tech companies. And I really do believe that what you are learning on the front line of digital diplomacy and on the front line of the Internet of digital diplomacy, you could definitely share here but i, I want to thank you so much and um, after your trip back from georgia to make the time to speak to me and speak to my viewers and to the listeners where can people find out more about you because they, they really need to go and check you guys out thank you so much for these uh, words uh, people can go and learn more about us on the web page bedigitaldiplomat.com this is our web page we, and we also have social media channels on uh, Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, they are titled uh, European Digital Diplomacy Exchange. So if you want to contact us or the con contact us there, you can also send us a private message on everywhere. So we are digital in any way in, in forum. So. Well, Miha and Ingrid, an absolute pleasure to see you and to speak to you today a continued success and we're all going to keep our eyes peeled for your new publication that is coming out wishing you a, a great day and thank you once again thank, thank you thank you so much joanne for having us level up your digital skills by taking our diploma in digital marketing plus gain an industry qualification use the code digital marketing 20 for a 20 percent discount visit publicsectormarketingpros.com thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the public sector marketing show i've got two resources for you today it's our upcoming webinars the next one is linkedin for leaders in the public sector and please always remember that if you can't make the webinar live if you register you will automatically get the replay and access to the slides as well and next for our agenda coming up in june is podcasting for public sector a lot more of you are jumping in to the podcasting space as we see the value of social audio grow and engagement rates increase and once again remember that even if you miss the live webinar which i deliver you can always get on demand but you need to register 
So that's it for another week. And um, if you haven't already, please share the show with a public sector pro that you know. You are my best advocates, better than anybody else or any social network that I can use. So if you haven't already, please share the show with a colleague. And don't forget, you can catch the podcast on your favorite Thank podcast Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Public Sector Marketing to. Show. And we also this episode has ended, but your digital journey Wednesday can continue. Head over to publicsectormarketingpros.com to access resources and links Have mentioned in today's show and to connect with Joanne and her team. Until the next time, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast platform. 